got one phrase for you. And I want you to slap somebody next to them and tell them, Jesus is enough. Don't slap somebody. Don't slap somebody. But look to your neighbor and tell them, Jesus is enough. That, that's, that phrase means everything to us, doesn't it? Jesus is enough. Do you believe that this morning? Oh, man, I'm going to get too excited. And then I can't move, but I've strapped myself. I left my mic back there. Everybody was good. I just forgot my mic this morning. You know, I was just so excited to preach this sermon because, look, Jesus is enough. Um, and, and it's like Alan was talking about earlier. Jesus takes things of the world that seem broken, that seem gross, that seem ugly, that seem out of place, and he makes them good. And he makes them holy. And he makes them beautiful. And the fact that God can do that with, yes, holiday seasons, but more importantly, that God can do that with his broken people. And not only make them whole, but use them in his kingdom for his purpose is a wonderful, wonderful news. And uh, that's what, to me, the Christmas season is all about. Jesus is enough. Say it one more time. Uh, To show the splendor of the newborn Savior, uh, there was this Christmas pageant or or, uh, Christmas show that a church was going to do. And they were so excited about the Christmas show and they invited all people from the community and they packed the auditorium full of people. And uh, in one particular scene during this Christmas show, uh, baby Jesus is in a manger and they put a light in the manger. And the goal was during one particular scene, all the lights are going to go out in the auditorium and it's going to be pitch dark. And the only light that was going to be seen was the manger and it was going to be lit up and it was going to just display the glory and the splendor. It was supposed to be a really powerful moment. And on the first night of the play, the, uh, the, the lights go out, but the manger light doesn't come on. And so everyone's just sitting in darkness. And it's real quiet for a moment. And then all of a sudden, over the loudspeaker, you hear someone whisper and they say, Hey, you just turned off Jesus. <laughs> you turned off Jesus. That was interesting to me. Uh, how about this one? There was a concerned little girl. She approached her father one day and she said, Daddy, I just don't believe it's right to ignore Jesus. And the father was confused and he looked at her and said, well, I agree, baby. It's, it's not right to ignore Jesus, but what in the world made you think of that? And she said, it's like that song we always sing at church. Oh, come let us ignore him. <laughs> you know, sometimes uh, those bad preacher jokes, they're, they're, they're pretty, pretty bad. Aren't they? Uh, sometimes we ignore Jesus on the holidays, you know. Uh, sometimes the holidays, they become so busy and there's so much things to do, so many things to check off of your list. And it's supposed to be the most wonderful time of the year. And it, it's supposed to be the most joyful season of all. And it's supposed to be a time of family, a time of peace. And it's almost as if, it, as Christmas is talked about, it's almost as if all problems go away for a season. You know, and that's the way it's advertised. But in reality, um, sometimes it's not that way. And sometimes the holiday season can be one of the most stressful times of the season. I was actually doing a little research on that because I was interested to see, like, what are statistics? It's actually statistically been a study. People do this, apparently. And they wanted to to test to see, are people more stressed during the holiday season? And and come to find out, uh, I think it broke about even, but it was a little bit more, I think just over, where people are a little bit more stressed at this time. Uh, Some people's family situations aren't good. Their job situations aren't good. Some people can't take off during the holidays. Some people are like Alan and just don't like the Christmas music that much. Um, And like they did all these things that showed how we can be stressed even at the holiday season. You know what I wish that we had? Um, And when you invent this, please let me know. Uh, you'll be a rich person. If, if everyone, as they walked through those doors and you sat down in the pew, like right now, I could just click a button and all of a sudden a little uh, chart would just come above each one of your heads. And like it would be like a battery level of stress, maybe like scale of one to ten. Let's do that. Scale of one to ten, you know, and it would be ten being the most stressful, one being just I just as joyful and peaceful as I could be. And I wish I could see where your number was. You know, because it would help me as I'm preparing my sermon and as I'm standing in front of you to see how are you, you know. But I don't want to take that for granted because I feel like there are a lot of you who sit out and 
you know, it is a wonderful time and there are good things to, to be had and you're gonna make the best of a tough season, but it doesn't mean that all of a sudden your problems and your difficulties in life stops happening because Christmas is here. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm, as I was thinking about this, um, I thought, what message could I send? What, what message could I teach uh, as we're approaching the holiday season? What's the most important thing? And that, that phrase just kept jumping in my mind. Jesus is enough. You know, and that's, that's kind of been a, a, a phrase that uh, it means a lot to me. Because when I'm broken and I'm dealing with my stress, I have to stop sometimes and remind myself. And that's a quick prayer I say in my head to myself as I'm driving in my car and different things. And, and I, you know, somebody cuts me off in traffic. Jesus is enough. Uh, but, but deeper than that, I think about the tough things that I go through and the things that give me stress and the things that I, I look at and say, man, I wish that this would just go away. We were talking in our, our young adult class this morning about what's our Jericho. You know, what's that, that thing in our life that we're marching around and we're asking God, take this wall down, make this go away, stop this, or, or I wish that this would fall. What is that for you? And I think everyone's got their Jericho. Everyone's got something this morning in your life that could be a little bit different. And, and so as we approach this message, I, I realize the gospel is pretty amazing. Because it's not the fact that Jesus saved us from uh, our struggle. But the gospel story is deeper than that. The incarnation story is deeper than that. The Christmas story is deeper than that. It's not that Jesus just saves us from the struggle, but he joins us in the struggle. And there's something powerful to that message. Jesus is enough. Uh, God could have just zapped all our problems away and just made them disappear. He can do that. God is that powerful. And yet... He doesn't just from a distance zap your problems away and leave you to live your life. He takes on flesh and comes down here with you and joins the struggle with you. What a God we have. Jesus is enough. Hebrews chapter 4 verses 15 and 16 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Listen, here's, here's the news that I have to break to you. I wish I could preach the sermon that would say, hey, right now, all the things in your life that are difficult would just go away. I wish I could give you that magic verse that's just going to make your holiday season the most wonderful time of the year, no matter what's going on. But I can't do that. But the message I have is that God doesn't promise to take away the pain and the struggle and the misery and the torment that's going on in your world and in your life. What God does is he joins you there. He meets you in the struggle and gives you the strength to make it through another day. That's what the promise of God is. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. You know, loneliness is a tough thing. It's, it's uh, 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 of all the people in the world who struggle with depression, which is a very common struggle, and I think it's a very human struggle that all of us at different times experience, but of, when you think of depression, loneliness is often a big part of that. And it's really interesting that sometimes you can even feel alone in a crowd. You ever felt that before? You ever felt like, you, you man, there's a lot of people around me, but I still feel like I'm the only person here? And, and, and that, that is a tough thing, and, and that eats away. Listen, if that's what you're going through, this kind of sounds crazy. If you're struggling with loneliness, know that you're not alone. But it's true. That is such a common thing. There are so many people in here who feel the same thing you are when you feel that way. And, and, and loneliness is something that so many people have felt for so many long, over so many generations, and it's a common problem. And that's why God addresses it so much in Scripture. And, and, and the truth is, is that you're not alone. We have a high priest who understands us, who's been there. He's been through it. And he's been, as Hebrews just said, he's been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he was without sin. He knows the struggle. And the beauty is not only does he know it, he's with you through it. And that's good news. That's the gospel. That's the beauty of the Christmas story. And that's the beauty of God in a manger. Jesus in a manger. Being held and dependent by a woman he created. Wow. What a story that is. Um, I, I've got some scripture that I want to share with you. 
Um, Uh, let, me, let me say this first. Uh, Christmas, it, it can be a stressful time. There's a reason. It's because the season is sometimes full of obligation and expectation. Uh, it is a time of the year where, yes, there's supposed to be all these great things that can happen, but you have other things that can stress you out. Not only just difficulties in your life, but also, I mean, putting up decorations, it, that's a huge thing around here. The amount of lights is insane. I don't know what it is about Texas that's so different from Louisiana. I mean, Louisiana, I thought, you know, we, man, we love Christmas, but y'all love Christmas. There's something special. Uh, you know, everything's bigger in Texas, and Christmas is that way too. Uh, the amount of lights in our neighborhood is crazy. Avery and I, we, we're one of the pity houses, you know? You drive by and you, you look, you drive by and you go, oh, they tried. <laughs> <laughs> That's our house, right? Like we just had to put something out there so at least we're not the haunted house on the street next to all the rest of the ones that are lit up like a beacon. I, I'm, there is one house in our neighborhood, and I live in Summerlin, and, and if that person lives here, more power to you. That's awesome. But I, you can see their house from outer space. I, I promise. I, I'm telling you. And, and they have those blow-up uh, like snowmen and reindeer, and then all of a sudden they had blow-up stuff on their roof. And it just, every day you drive by, or every week I drive by, there's something new every week. They just keep putting something out. And I'm like, I'm done, I'm done. I'm not, I'm not can't compete with this, you know. So I'm just going to be content with my pity lights. But, but decorations to be put up, sometimes that's a stressful thing, you know. Uh, baking has to be done. House has to be clean. Family's coming over. There's all these things that can cause stress, not just difficult situations in your life, but just the holiday season in general. And sometimes that leads us to... Uh, we, we just kind of forget what it's all really about because we get so busy with everything else. Do you remember? I said this before. The opposite of worship is not sin, but what? Very good. Everybody say distraction. That's the opposite of worship. Remember that. You'll hear me say it more often. I'm glad se several of you did remember. I'm proud. Um, that's the op if, if Satan's goal is not to get you to fall into sin necessarily. His goal is to distract you from keeping your focus on him. And if he can do that with good things or sinful things, he'll do it. It doesn't matter to him just as long as you don't focus on our God. And, and so here's the challenge for us as we step into another Christmas season in which you've heard so many sermons and so many messages. And, and the application is still the same. Focus on him this season. Don't let it go by without opening up your scripture, without opening up your Bible, without getting out your prayer journal and writing down your prayer. Without focusing on who it's all about it. I think the biggest uh, stress um, that we have comes from our expectations. Uh, we expect this false reality that Christmas is just going to be the most wonderful time of the year sometimes. And we have these expectations that this is going to be the best thing ever. And then we wind up realizing life is still happening and struggles still happen. The reason I'm saying that is because that's exactly what happens to the Jews in Scripture. And so what I want to do is I want to show you just very quickly uh, in several different places um, some of the expectations that the Jews have. Let's start in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. I've got these Scriptures on the slides. Guys, if y'all could put those up. Yeah. That way you can follow along there because we're going to have several that we're going to read. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. It says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw a star when it rose and have come to worship him. And when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed in all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born, in Bethlehem. In Judea, they replied. For this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people. Uh, this is really interesting because the expectation of, of people in Scripture on the Messiah was that he was going to be what? He's going to be a warrior. He's going to be mighty. He's going to come and take care of all of my enemies. He's going to save me from all of my, my foes. He's going to deliver me. And he's going to raise Israel up and his nation up 
And we will be the most powerful, most uh, successful, most wealthy and well taken care of people. That's the Messiah. And so they're waiting for this grand warrior to come. And, and it, it happens, it starts in certain passages as they interpret them. Um, they misunderstand who the Messiah is. So look at Micah chapter 5 verses 2 through 4, which is where this prophecy we just read of came from. It says, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Therefore, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of, his, of the Lord his God. And they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach the ends of the earth. You see how their expectation of the Messiah could have been this guy who's going to come in and just take over. There's more. Uh, we'll read three more here. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 9 through 11. Listen to this one. Isaiah 40, 9 through 11. You, bring, you who bring good news to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up. Do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power and he rules with a mighty arm. See, his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arm and he carries them close to his heart. And he gently leads those that have young. And so there's this, this picture of this mighty warrior who's going to protect all his people and bring them in close. And, and that's their picture of the Messiah. Psalm 72. Starting in verse 3. May the mountains bring prosperity to the people, the hills, the fruit of righteousness. May he defend the afflicted among the people and save the children of the needy. May he crush the oppressor. May he endure as long as the sun, as long as the moon, through all generations. May he be like rain falling on a mown field, like showers watering the earth. In his days, may the righteous flourish and the prosperity abound till the moon is no more. May he rule from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. May the desert tribes bow before him and his enemies lick the dust. May the king of Tarshish and the distant shores bring tribute to him. May the kings of Sheba and Seba bring him gifts. May all kings bow down to him and all nations serve him. Uh, that, again, it's just this picture that they have of the Messiah. Their expectation doesn't really match reality. Although these prophecies are very true of, of Jesus, they misinterpret them. They, mis they, they misunderstood who he was and what he was going to do. And then there's the big one which is in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. Let's read this one. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Nephtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoiced at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressors. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire for uh, to us a child is born. See, we understand that, that all of this that's going to happen is going to happen not through some mighty warrior, but through a, a baby born of a virgin. And, and we get the full picture. We get the full story. We know what to expect, but when they were reading, they didn't see it. It was still a mystery yet to be revealed for them. As I continue, for us, to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, 
mighty God, everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He's going to be, bring peace to the world of the greatness of his government and peace. There will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. They were expecting a Messiah who's going to come in and he's going to save them from their enemies. Who is going to save them from their afflictions. Who's going to save them from their diseases. Who's going to save them from the chaos in their world. And it was just going to come in and bring peace into their world. And, and, and here's my only point for you this morning. If you haven't got anything, this is what I want you to get right here. So don't miss it. Jesus, the story of the incarnation. The story of the manger is that God's not coming to save us from all the stuff in the world. God's coming to join us in all of it. And what a beautiful God we have. A wonderful story that is to know that God was willing not to just zap the problems away, but to come down and endure them with us and for us on our behalf. You ever felt alone? You're not. That's, that's the Christmas story. I, I think about my dog, Pippin. Um, you know, I put him in the cage, the dog cage. And when I first got him, I don't do that anymore because he goes bonkers when you put him in this little cage. You put him in this box, he just starts barking. And, and, and I used to live in this apartment. And my next door neighbors would get all upset because all day long when I was stepped out of the house, when I stepped out of those doors, he would yelp and he would bark and he would holler. And it was, it was horrible for everyone around. And the reason that he would do that is because what's he, what's he scared of? Are you coming back? Uh, he, he showed up at my doorstep. And so he ran away from his home. I don't know how it happened. He's a little Yorkie. He, as he showed up to my door, I opened up the door. Yes, there were snow flurries coming down in Louisiana. Uh, very rare. And, and so I open up the door and this little dog runs in. And a little Yorkie. And he's got a jacket on that says, Mom is a little man. And I said, well, come on in, you know, and uh, make yourself at home. And... I went and looked for the owner. It took about a month of searching, and, and finally the vet just said, look, they're obviously not looking for him. Um, you've put it everywhere. He's your dog. And so that's how I got him. And I, I wonder if that's not some of why he freaks out when he's in this cage and when he's left alone is as I walk out the door, is anyone going to come back for me? I wonder if he remembers that I had owners, I had a family, I had people that loved me and took care of me. I mean, he was, he was well taken care of. He was groomed. He smelled great. He had just had a bath. I mean, he was a, a well-trained, well, he was potty trained. Uh, imagine a, a perfect dog showing up to your house and he's already potty trained and everything. It was wonderful. Uh, and, and sometimes I wondered, maybe the reason he cries out so much when I'm gone constantly over and over again is because he's scared that it'll happen again and he doesn't want to be alone. And then uh, I thought, you know what, it, it's, it's, it was such a sad picture for me to sit there and picture him barking out and hollering and, and calling and there was no one there to hear except the next door neighbors. <laughs> And then I thought, you know what? Sometimes that's how we feel in prayer. That's, that's how we feel in our situations. And sometimes it feels like we're calling out and we're crying out and we're barking out, but there's no one there to hear us. But that's not the story of Christmas. The story of Christmas is that not only is there a God to hear you, there's a God with you. Emmanuel, God with us. He is here. Jesus is enough. And that's what we have to remember this Christmas season. No matter the stress, stress and the struggle that you're going through, Jesus is enough. And you're not alone. Uh, I think about the story where the, there's these Native American tribes. And what they would do is when a young boy would get to the age of 13 years old, these tribes would uh, have kind of a ceremony or a tradition or a ritual that they would go through for that young 13-year-old boy to become a man. And what they would do is they would blindfold him and they would lead him out into the jungle. And, and they would take him miles and miles away from his village. And they would put him in this jungle and lead him way out in the middle of nowhere. All he has is a spear to defend himself. And they tell him to wait for a certain amount of time before he takes off his blindfold. And when he takes off his blindfold, this 13-year-old kid looks around and realizes that he's completely alone. And I'm sure you can imagine the panic that goes through a 13-year-old boy's heart and mind as he looks around and real. I mean, the... the the amount of, I mean, he's been protected his whole life. He's been taken care of his whole life. He's felt secure his whole life. He's had the others there when he didn't know answers his whole life. And now he looks around and he's completely alone. 
And the first few days after he gets through the initial shock of it, the initial tears of it, the initial stress of it, everything's going well and everything seems fine. But then he hears twigs snapping and, and a bird chirping and every little thing, you know, he jumps and he's scared, you know. And then one day he hears something in front of him and he looks and there's a leopard there in front of him. And, and it's his first real face of danger and, and, and he's scared and he's nervous and he's not sure what to do. And he picks up some rocks and starts throwing them at it and starts hollering and hooping and trying to just intimidate it and scare it off. And uh, the leopard does. It stalks away, luckily, uh, for this 13-year-old boy. And then he hears more twigs snap behind him and he turns and looks and there behind him is the shape of a man with bow and arrow drawn on that leopard. And he realized that it was his dad. And his dad had been camped out there with him the whole night. He was never really alone. Although it felt like he was alone, it looked like he was alone, it seemed like he was alone, the fear was still there and the feelings were there of loneliness. The truth was that his dad was there the whole time. And that's the story of the gospel. God looked on man's loneliness and saw that it was not good. In all of his creation, oh, it was good, it was good, it was good. But then he looked at man's loneliness and he said, no, this is not good. I've got to do something about this. And then not only did he create the woman in that instance, but then he takes it a step farther as God takes on flesh and says, no, I'm going to my people. I'm going to my children. And he comes to us. What an awesome God we serve. As I was thinking about that, uh, this is where I want to close is in Daniel chapter 3. And you can look there. Uh, Daniel chapter 3. And you, you know this story. You've read this story so many times. But I want us to look at this again because it, it just, as I think about God with us, as I think about the manger, as I think about a God who decided to take on flesh and come down and not just be made man, but servant of men. I can't help but think of this scripture. Starting in verse 19 of Daniel chapter 3, it says, Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And his attitude towards them had changed. And, and so if, if you don't know this story, at this point you've got three faithful people. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, I don't remember the veggie tail names. Uh, uh, does y'all remember? Shad, Shad, anyway, it doesn't matter. Rack, Shack, and Benny. Rack, Shack, and Benny. That's right. And uh, so some of you, I mean, this goes way back. You've heard the story for, as you know, showing it to your kids in the veggie tail form. Um, but Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, are there in Nebuchadnezzar's uh, court. And Nebuchadnezzar builds this idol. And he commands everyone to worship it. And, and, and these three men decided, no, we're not going to do that. And they refused to bow down and to worship this false idol because they trust in God. And so then, verse 19, Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And his attitude towards them changed. And he ordered the furnace to be heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. And so these three men, wearing the robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and they were thrown into a blazing furnace. And you've got to stop and imagine that this is the first time that you're ever reading this. I mean, you, you see these men who were faithful to God and they did everything they were supposed to do. And in the face of false idols, they stood up for Jesus. They stood up for God and they said, no, we're not going to bow down. And yet, God, why are you letting them fall into the flames? Like if you're reading this and you've, you've read through the story, you've seen God work. You've seen him part the waters. You've seen him uh, rain food down from heaven to keep his people from going hungry. You, you've seen David kill Goliath with a stone. You've seen all of this. And so as you're reading this, you just know God's going to show up at the right moment. And he's going to take care of this. And he's going to deliver them. And they're not going to be tossed into the flames. And his enemies are going to wind up in the furnace. Something great's going to happen here. And then you read that scripture. Verse 23. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. You know, I don't know what your stress is this holiday season and the things that are going on in your life. But uh, I know at many times in your life, you'll ask the question, God, what are you doing? Where are you? 
And it doesn't mean a lack of faith. Sometimes it's just like, I've been waiting for this, and and God, I'm still waiting. You ever felt like that before? I'm still here. Where are you? And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the furnace. And then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men who were, they were what? They were tied up. And they were thrown into the fire. And they replied, well, certainly, your majesty. Of course there was. And then he said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth looks like a son of the gods. A lot of uh, Bible scholars believe that this is Jesus uh, before he is incarnate who has appeared in the flames. I don't know if you believe that or not. Do your own study. Uh, I, I told the Seekers class last Wednesday as well, there's uh, an angel in Scripture called the Angel of the Lord. I had to write a 12-page paper on the Angel of the Lord when I was at Sunset. I believe my view. There's so many different views. Who is this angel? You know, there's this angel that shows up on the scene, the Angel of the Lord. And when people see this angel, here's what I know. From scripture. I might not know, they don't give me the name, but people treat this angel different than any other angel. That people fall down and they worship this angel. People, people treat this angel different, and this angel is singled out in scripture, and it is the same angel that keeps showing up, the angel of the Lord. I believe my interpretation, I believe that's Jesus in the flank with them. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are in the flames. Uh, He says, verse 25, look, I see four men walking around in the fire. Here's what we know. They're unbound and they're unharmed. And the fourth looks like one of the sons of God. Verse 26, Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them and they saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies nor was a hair on their head singed. Their robes were not scorched and there was no smell of fire on them. And then Nebuchadnezzar said, praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him, and they defied the king's command, and they were willing to give up their lives rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I decree that, any pe- that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut to pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other god can save in this way. No other God can save in this way. That's, to me, that's the incarnation story. That's the Christmas story. We don't have a God who saved us from the flames. We have a God who joined us in the flames. Did you notice? Nothing on them, not even their clothes got burned. Not a hair on their head was singed. The only thing that burned up in that fire was the the, the bonds that were holding. The ropes that had them bound. There was freedom in the flames for them. It looked like chaos. It looked like life was over. It looked like the moment where uh, I'm alone and, and this is, it's over. And yet Jesus shows up in the flames or an angel shows up in the flames. And the only thing that gets burned are the things that were tying them down. That's the incarnation story. That's Jesus taken on flesh. Jesus is enough. Let's pray. God, thank you so much. For this beautiful story of Christmas and what it means for your incarnation, for coming and taking on flesh. And we know scripture tells us that you gave up e- equality with God in order to take on flesh. And, and though we don't know what that fully means, God, we thank you that you were so selfless and so outward focused that you cared enough about us as broken people to come to this earth, to take on flesh and to be born in a manger of all places for us. To join us in our struggle, not to just zap our problems away, but to help carry us through them, to get in the flames with us. And God, no matter what stress we have this season, uh, life is tough, this world is full of tribulation, but God, because you have overcome the world, we can have confidence in you because of what you've done through coming here and taking on flesh, living a sinless life, and giving that life up for us on the cross. And we thank you that it didn't stop there but that there was an empty tomb to give us hope and that you would give us the promise of one day coming back for us. 
We love you. We can never thank you enough. And I pray that at this holiday season, we're not distracted, but that we will worship you by giving you our full attention. No matter the amount of gifts, no matter the amount of stress, no matter the amount of traffic. God, I pray that you're the center of our attention through this entire season. We love you. And this is our prayer in Jesus Christ's name. And the church said, if there's anything that you need, this is your chance to respond. Won't you come? Why don't you